clear my screen so that way you will be able to um, uh, you'll be able to see me and I've just agreed to that to it being recorded so this is all good fantastic now can you see that screen we can indeed thank you I'm just going I'll to just... widen that um, going to widen that up so Gary you can just reduce okay. it at the top right hand corner so yes just I've... have a single person and you can I've done that now. Move it right up the top. So, well, let, let's get underway then. So, welcome um, everybody. My name's David Gilchrist, and this is session six A of the Asia Pacific Economic and Business History Conference 2021. It's lovely to be able to host you from UWA. Notwithstanding, I know we've got people from all over the world, which is just uh, wonderful. Um, I'd like to just to record my uh, respect for the uh, local uh, First Nations people the Wajok people of the Noongar Nation and all of the First Nations people um, on whose land uh, you're occupying as you participate. We have two papers in this session, so we've up to 45 minutes per paper if we wish to use that time. Um, and very happy for the uh, questions to be uh, put onto the chat, and then we can perhaps look at it uh, afterwards as well as obviously having 10 minutes or so after the paper to be able to talk about those papers. So we can uh, take it at the speaker's leisure. Our first speaker is Gary Osman and his paper's entitled Sport and Queensland Aboriginal Reserves in the 1920s and 1930s, Ideology, Profit and Exploitation. I'll hand over to you, Gary. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, uh, just following on from your acknowledgement, David, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which UQ and Monash uh, sit. But also, uh, perhaps more significantly, I'd like to acknowledge the Queensland Aboriginal settlements uh, where this paper is based. I work in several um, former uh, Queensland Aboriginal settlements here in the state, and I work with elders on sport history projects. And I'd like to acknowledge their deep connection to land and culture, but also to their history. It's very important to, um, to those communities. And this paper will be jointly delivered by Lionel and myself. So I think uh, Lionel is going to begin with the first few slides and then we'll uh, take turns. So over to you, Lionel. Thank you, Gary, and, and thank you, David. Uh, this, paper, uh, this paper is a result of Gary and my share, shared interest in sports history, but also um, Indigenous well-being. And the paper, uh, you might be puzzled as to why this is in a WA session. Uh, the paper is all about uh, the extent and nature of forced incarceration of Aboriginal people in reserves in Queensland. And the Queensland model that was established, that became the model for Western Australia, as well as South Australia and the Northern Territory. Uh, Western Australia from 1905, uh, SA and NT by 1911. Uh, so hence, this is why we are in this uh, session, because what we're saying speaks to the extent of control over Aboriginal people in WA. This was a period in which Aboriginal access, access to sport uh, opened up, not only in Queensland, but uh, also in Victoria with um, Australian rules football. Um, this is also the period in which we see the start of the prominence of, of Aboriginal people in, uh, in Australian rugby league. Uh, in both AFL and NRL, Indigenous people are overrepresented compared to their share of the population. And in NRL, there's, of, of course, a very high proportion of uh, people of um, Polynesian descent as well. So this is a paper about sport on Aboriginal reserves and sport outside Aboriginal reserves. Uh, this process, this, um, the official support for these games hasn't really been analysed. So what we're going to do is look at the financial consequences of this as 
business historians, uh, and we're going to consider uh, wh what the consequences were for <laughs> Aboriginal people. We'll consider whether there were benefits and we'll consider the costs and we'll also weigh up the, uh, the ethical issues as well. Now, please note that the Queensland legislation applied to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, uh, but the situation, Gary's an expert on Torres Strait Islander uh, sport uh, and, um, and people. Um, the situation was different in the Torres Strait Islands. And so we're speaking to the experience of mainland Aboriginal people. So next slide. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Um, if you were at our conference last year, uh, Boyd Hunter gave a, a terrific paper. Boyd's a leading scholar of um, Aboriginal Australia. Uh, his work with David Carmody, recent work, estimates the Aboriginal population of Australia at uh, 800,000 just prior to um, just prior to white settlement. Uh, there's a, a rapid decline due to smallpox and then further declines due to frontier violence, impact of disease and so on. By 1850, the population is down to about 200,000. Uh, in the 20th century, when we're looking at the population is pretty much stabilised so we're looking in the 20s and 30s where the population's being reduced quite drastically uh, and the legislation is established in Queensland uh, to provide a way of protecting uh, the surviving Indigenous people. Um, pastoral, the pastoral frontier expands in two areas, um, in two sort of arms. One is towards uh, Cape York, uh, the other one is from Perth up towards the Kimberley. And the actual, there was ferocious uh, and brave frontier resistance from the Indigenous people, but their dispossession uh, was never as complete as it was in Victoria and New South Wales. And as the pastoral frontier expands, uh, Indigenous people are employed on cattle stations, uh, wherever labour is in scarce supply. So before we leave this slide, um, the population is officially 66,000 in 1947. Um, it's now 800,000 and growing. So, but that's outside the period of our paper. So next slide, please. Uh, so, the key legislation for us is uh, the Queensland Act of 1897. And as I said, this became the model for legislation in WA and elsewhere. Um, in Victoria and New South Wales, where the destruction of the Aboriginal population was much quicker and much more complete, uh, there was an initial policy of uh, humanitarian policy from the British government until self-government uh, and then after self-government Victoria establishes reserves to protect Aboriginal people uh, and then there is a policy of absorption of people who Aboriginal people of mixed race uh, they are expected to become absorbed into the broader society. The Queensland legislation was different because there were more Aboriginal people and frontier violence was still an issue. So the 1897 legislation puts Aborigines in a separate legal category and they're under the guardianship of the chief protector of the Aborigines. This was a highly restrictive approach, highly illiberal, uh, but it was the product of a bipartisan desire to prevent complete genocide and to protect Aboriginal people from uh, abusive, abusive employers. This was meant to create 
a safe place where the assumption was that the Aboriginal people would eventually, their demise would take place. So the Chief Protector had uh, extraordinary powers over Aboriginal people. Uh, he could direct any Aboriginal person to locate on a reserve and they would be forced to remain on the reserve. Um, had uh, discretionary power to remove children from their parents. Um, they could approve contracts for employment uh, outside the reserves, they were one year permits. So anyone wanting to leave the reserve needed official permission. So next slide is Gary taking over. Thank you, Lionel. So let's turn our attention now to the reserves themselves that were created under the Protection Act of 1897 and maintained um, uh, through subsequent pieces of legislation you know, right through to the 70s. And these are still thriving communities, but they're now uh, autonomously run by Aboriginal Shire Councils. So the three main settlements I've highlighted here, if you can see, Sherberg uh, is the southernmost uh, reserve or government settlement. It was founded as Baramba and changed its name later. And that's almost four hours north of Brisbane to give you a sense of scale. Uh, Warabinda, was established in 1927. That's in the central highlands of Queensland. And the third uh, large settlement is Palm Island, which you uh, no doubt all know. There were several other smaller reserves in Cape York, and you can see those named on the map. This map also names uh, various religious um, run missions. So there were two sets of uh, reserves, if you like, the government settlements and church-run missions. But our focus, uh, because this is where sport was played most prominently and where rugby league teams were formed and allowed to travel, are these three, Baramba, Sherberg, Warabinda, and Palm Island. It's estimated that about 40% of Aboriginal people in Queensland were forcibly uh, incarcerated in these reserves. The remaining 60% lived throughout the state, either governed by local protectors or uh, police officers, but except for a very small handful of exempt people, um, all Aboriginal people in Queensland were under the act, but 40% lived on these uh, settlements. These settlements um, were placed in places, and I'm quoting here, of splendid seclusion. The idea was to isolate and segregate Aboriginal people, partly for their protection and partly to keep them out of the sight lines of white communities. So sport on these um, reserves remained largely an internal affair until the mid-1920s when we start to see teams traveling out. Uh, sport was very much a male activity, and the prominent sports were boxing, cricket, and football. And this is an area, this is an era uh, when uh, rugby league was emerging. It began in Queensland in the 19 teens. So you had rugby union, perhaps, and soccer initially, but league quickly becomes the dominant sport. And these sports were encouraged um, largely under uh, notions of, of civilization. At, under civilizing ideologies based largely around muscular Christianity where physical activity uh, and sport would serve, um, would serve, would keep people both tractable but also serve state interests. So until the mid twenties, the key point here is people, sport was happening on the reserves. What happens from the mid twenties is we start seeing an increasing number of rugby league teams traveling out from the settlements to the major cities, to the capital Brisbane and the surrounding large cities, but also to regional uh, towns, places like Bundaberg, Maryborough, Rockhampton, Townsville, places that weren't so far from the settlements. And we've been able to chronicle about, or at least 70 league games in that period, the first 15 years, beginning uh, around 1925. And I have a photo here just to give you a sense. So this is um, these games, this is a, 
a photo of a Palm Island game playing a inter-club Brisbane team in Brisbane in 1928. Uh, many of the white players here were first class players, so that's how they were reported. The Aboriginal players were a sensation. There weren't great expectations initially of their abilities, but they soon proved otherwise. What may not be obvious from the photo is that in the early years, the Aboriginal teams were playing barefoot. So I guess a central question for us in developing this paper is why were these uh, games allowed to happen. They weren't just allowed, but they were encouraged. And the civilizing ideology really isn't enough to explain this. Local competition with small local towns was feasible, and it would have been a lot less costly, both in terms of the expense, but also in terms of sending out chaperones, valuable staff from the, uh, the settlements. So why was this uh, encouraged? Back to Lionel. Sorry. Uh, thanks, Gary. So what we're interested in then is what was, was there a financial imperative here? Uh, as Gary said, you could have easily just run local competitions, but in fact, they took the show on the road. And what are the financial implications of that? Well, we can think of the players themselves as contributing labor services here. And that could actually generate uh, marginal revenue uh, for the settlements. The workers themselves, the players, only got pocket money. Uh, so the, pay, the players weren't paid. So potentially um, the um, the, the reserves themselves could make, uh, could, um, could earn revenue from these games. Now, in the, uh, in, during the Great Depression, of course, uh, there were some strong budgetary constraints. 1929, the, um, the department's budget is cut by 20%, and there is a specific direct directive um, that the settlements are to become more self-supporting, to be re less reliant on distribution of government revenue. So uh, we, we have this quote here, uh, steps are being taken to improve the earning capacity of the settlements mentioned. So potentially that's something that these football games could uh, contribute to. So next, next slide, please. Yeah, and Lionel, I think I'm happy to take over here again. Oh, yes, that's your one. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> No trouble. So what's happening here now, we have two things. We have a financial imperative, so the settlements need uh, to be more self-supporting financially. We also have an increasing interest around the state from uh, white communities in these Aboriginal teams who are proving to be better players than expected. Uh, each of these settlements has uh, a local administration. There's a superintendent on each settlement, and then there's a team of administrative staff. Normally, decisions around things like sport and leisure would be in the hands of those local uh, administrators. But the, these sporting opportunities come under the chief protector's gaze, and the chief protector starts to dictate terms and insisting that every single decision related to these matches come through his office. Um, and there's a little bit of tension that we see in the correspondence between the superintendents and the chief protector. So here we have the chief protector on the 3rd of August, 1933, writing to the superintendent at Sherberg, insisting that, and I don't know exactly which match this is uh, in relation to, but insisting that um, reasonable terms, or actually actually reminding the super that reasonable terms for all games uh, are these, 60% of the gate or all expenses plus 10 pounds a profit, whichever is the greater. And you can, reading between the lines, you can see how the Sherberg superintendent gets his back up and he reminds the chief protector that in every case, we never run a football match at a loss. 
but you see this very close scrutinizing of all matches, even down to um, budgets for lunches. There's one beautiful piece of correspondence where the uh, chief protector queries what looked to me to be a fairly inexpensive lunch of a sandwich and tea in, let's say, Rockhampton. And the chief protector writes back and, say, and says, I think uh, we could save some money here by the players bringing their own cut lunches. So nothing passes his scrutiny. Um, as part of the uh, revenue raising scheme, the settlements also send out what we'll call cultural performers. So at nearly every football match, even in small communities, the footballers were either accompanied by corroboree dancers and spear or boomerang throwers or some of the football players themselves perform those roles. So we've included a small ad here as an example. Uh, this is a game in 1933 in Maryborough where football is the headline. That's what's being advertised. But you can see they're also promoting exhibitions of spear and boomerang throwing by the Aboriginals. And this is a way of uh, uh, maximizing attendance, getting bums on seats. And this works spectacularly. So what I'm going to do now is just run through a few um, account, accounts and financial reports. So these uh, have all come from files held at the Queensland State Archives. One of the problems we've encountered in re researching this is that reporting is infrequent and it's not always transparent. So a full set of uh, accounts isn't available, but there's enough here to give us a sense of the sorts of uh, sums that were being generated in those early years and why you know, there was uh, such um, impetus to keep this going. So this first slide is of a two year report from the late 1920s showing sundries. So of 8,000 uh, pounds received into this particular account, uh, the second item here shows what was generated from football matches. And it's, if you can see that, it's just over 2,000 pounds, which is a quarter of the total revenue um, generated. What interested me in this slide is um, the third item, the sale of pearls, TI is Thursday Island. We know a lot about the uh, economic value of the pearl and Beche de Mer and Trepang fishery in the Torres Strait. And we know that um, Pearls, for example, in this period were a great revenue earner, but in this case, at least in this report, we can see football matches uh, generating twice that income. The next slide is from the Department of Native Affairs annual report for 1928. So in, there was a period where every year they published quite detailed accounts and then they stop. But in 1928, we're looking at revenue generated from Palm Island footballers, which represents, again, in this particular account, about 9% of gross income. And when you um, then subtract the expenses related to that, there's, uh, and the expenses were quite high, you can see 337 pounds. It's because Palm Island is an island and it's quite expensive getting people off to um, even nearby Townsville. But even with expenses accounted, we have a 405 pound net income in that year. So it's quite a significant contributor to the coffers. In the next annual report for 1929, we again have football reported on. In this case, Baramba has joined the game. So Palm Island and Baramba Sherberg are now actively sending out teams. And again, you can see um, there's a gross income from the two of just over 1,000 pounds. And when you deduct their expenses, which again are significant, and if you look at Palm Island, you can see, you know, it's, uh, it's quite a large expense, 500 pounds. We still have a net income of 423 pounds, which in the case of this account represents about 7% of uh, the overall income. Now, not all matches were um, hugely lucrative. Some of those early matches involving Palm uh, 
Warbinda and Sherberg, especially in Brisbane, did generate uh, large sums. This is um, for a single game. This slide probably gives you a, a better indication. So there's a very small net profit, just over five pounds in this one day match in Maryborough involving a Sherberg team. But as Lyle pointed out, that's quite a nice rate of return on your expenses of 24 pounds. And over these two decades, um, we see you know, quite a decent amount of profit being generated. I'm gonna hand back to Lionel. Okay, so uh, we, we looked at the issue of, was there any money made? That leads to the obvious issue of, well, where did the money go and what was it used for? Uh, as we said, the players were not paid and the reserves weren't paid directly. So where did it go? Did, did the money just go into consolidated revenue? Uh, well, the answer is no. And um, a, an Aboriginal's protection of property account was set up. Uh, and this was used to, um, to lend money to uh, Indigenous businesses, uh, for supporting people who are destitute, for rations, uh, to fund infrastructure uh, on the reserves and so on. So in theory, if this sport is generating money, that money could be used to benefit Indigenous people. It's not just a complete dead weight loss. It's not money down the drain. And there are newspaper reports of suggesting this, that... Uh, that, that Aboriginal people are, are now getting access to um, quite large amounts of money and down the bottom, um, short experiment crowned with success, earnings at sport. This is all a very positive message. Um, here we're sort of seeing hints of what became known as self-determination after World War II. Theoretically, we, we, we could be looking at um, Indigenous people playing a sport they love, they generate revenue, it goes back into this fund that's reinvested productively in Aboriginal welfare. So Gary, now over to you. All right. So what's interesting from the correspondence is that there are references throughout the correspondence that these funds were intended to be returned to uh, the communities to fund various sporting activities. And there's a quote here from the Chief Protector in 1937, claiming that um, these profits are for the use of our, and he's talking about community sports funds, and that's why um, as much profit as possible needs to be generated from these football matches. In truth, it's very difficult to, um, to analyze exactly how much money did go back to the, to the reserves for sport. We know that those funds were used, as Lionel pointed out, for infrastructure, for the development of sewerage, for example, uh, on the reserves. But the exact amount in the 20s and 30s, at least, that went back to the settlements for sport-related purposes is, um, you know, it's really difficult to, to gauge, but certainly there's no evidence of any substantial outlays on sport that would be commensurate with those profits that were made. And there is certainly much reference in the correspondence to uh, accountability issues. Uh, so there, was, uh, there were complaints, and this is from auditors themselves, that these various funds weren't being properly audited. Um, so I guess in answer to the question, where did the money go? Um, it's fairly clear that most of that, very little of that money actually went back to community sport. Players, um, sort of football players were playing barefoot for a long, long time. Uh, there are many complaints of uniforms in tatters. There are great problems reported on the reserves in terms of access to equipment playing equipment and facilities. Uh, so something's happening uh, to this money. Now, of course, some money does go back to the community, either for sport or for other uh, purposes, which then raises 
um, questions about the ethics of this uh, sporting program. And as Lionel referred to in the introduction, there are a number of positives that came from this beyond the uh, joie de vivre and the, the sporting spirit for the players themselves. So, you know, as I said, it's impossible to assess whether revenue generated from the games uh, was used productively or to know exactly how it was shared among communities. But to the extent that that particular fund, the um, Aboriginal Protection of Property Fund, was used as a welfare and maintenance fund for the communities, uh, then I think we can see that sport did make some positive uh, contribution. Sport was also um, a great recreational and morale booster for the men who played and for the men who traveled. There are records of them meeting up with mob, meeting up with family, uh, relatives, friends, who they otherwise couldn't see because they led, uh, they were inmates, and inmate is the word, they were inmates of these reserves, and sport was one of the few ways they could get out and meet up with people on the sidelines in a very limited way. I think a total another, of 15 minutes remaining, Gary. Thank you. We're almost at the end here. Another um, positive would be the cultural, cultural continuity through those displays of culture, dancing, boomerang, throwing, etc. And Tom Blake, who's the historian of Sherberg, has talked about the role that sport played in building a community identity uh, amongst people on the settlements, remembering that people on the settlements were thrown together from all over the state with no choice, uh, speaking different languages. Uh, this helped build up, uh, in Sherberg's case, a Sherberg identity. And as Lionel alluded, uh, from this period, we have a strong we have a strong legacy uh, of Aboriginal Rugby League, which we see today. But I don't think it's enough to dwell or to stop at those positives. Uh, there are many negatives here. I mean, one of them, I guess, is sporting profits were part, arguably part of a larger um, economic system that spared the state from providing and paying for welfare, or at least reduced the state's contribution. Um, we also have to bear in mind that the reserve system, which was set up ostensibly for the good of people by the 1930s, was increasingly controlling and paternalistic. Ray Evans, historian Ray Evans, reminds us that the lives of people on those settlements were arbitrarily imperiled by the high degree of monitoring and surveillance and supervision. People had very little agency, and there are many examples there are life writings, memoirs, biographical writings by former inmates of these settlements as older men, people like Willie Fide from Palm Island, who talk about how they were treated as players. And the last bit of this um, quotation here from Willie gives a sense of his um, unhappiness. You know, we were instructed not to touch drink, have to behave ourselves just like a mob of kids. And other former players talk about how they were lock, the, the coaches would lock up the team be, the night before games to make sure they couldn't drink. Now, I'm just going to quote Willie Thade again here. He, um, he, he says, I don't know why we were treated by this, why we were surveilled this way. We're civilized, we know what to do. It was different if we went out and murdered, raped, or were scrapping, but we do nothing of that sort. We only go for football. I don't think in the rest of the world they do like they do for us Aboriginals in Queensland from the settlements. Doesn't matter where we go, we belong to the police. This brings me to our final slide, which is to attempt to draw a link to larger economic issues here, and in particular, the issue of stolen wages in Queensland. So all wages of all Aboriginal workers on the reserves, on the settlements, uh, went to uh, government coffers with workers themselves receiving only pocket money, if that. In theory, they had access to their accounts, but in reality, uh, very little of that money ever trickled back to those people until recent years when various stolen wages class actions have uh, occurred in Queensland and been successful. And um, not so long ago, the Queensland government released quite a large sum of money 
to the descendants of uh, and survivors of this period, I think mainly into scholarship funds, et cetera. And there's currently a, a class action on stolen wages being resolved. And I think we, uh, um, I guess what we're trying to do in this paper and with this project is to think of these sporting profits in some ways as fitting this. Uh, this was an amateur era. Those players were never going to receive money payment from this anyway. But uh, the fact is very little of the fairly si significant sums generated were returned in any form to those communities, which lived in abject poverty uh, for many decades. Thank you very much. We're happy to take questions. Thank you, Lionel and Gary. Uh, great presentation and a really interesting paper. Any questions, folks? I might take the chair's prerogative then and um, perhaps make a comment and also um, just ask a couple of questions. Uh, I was, it was a really interesting paper and uh, fascinated by it, but um, selfishly also fascinated from the perspective of my paper in the next session uh, in relation to um, uh, essentially the welfare state in Australia and, and colonial uh, and then state socialism. And I'm quite intrigued um, on a number of points. One, it seems to me that going right back to the start of your discussion around um, why, uh, what, how these games were organised and why, uh, what the value uh, of them was, um, it seems there's a showmanship element there that if Aboriginal people are remo removed from mainstream communities, then there was a saleability or an attraction in terms of an event involving those people that might have attracted a market. Uh, which is quite interesting to see in the resulting profits that seem to be generated. Um, secondly, uh, I was really pleased to see you using the accounting information because I think that's often not what we do. And I'm, I'm quite, uh, as an accountant, um, particularly uh, buoyed by the analysis and, and interested in the analysis. But was, I think, I guess then coming to the um, point uh, in relation to the welfare state, I wonder if part of the legacy of the story you've just told has been the result of ultimately equity or justice being served at one level so that Aboriginal people, for instance, didn't need to uh, perform those tasks to generate the money that seems to have gone back into the running of the department, So, but that ultimately the welfare state was created so that the government was left with the um, moral requirement to provide these services, but not necessarily the income generated out of those services. Um, that's quite an interesting uh, angle for me, and I'm just wondering if you've got any comments on any of those comments. Thank you. Thank you, David. Th those, are, those are really good comments, really interesting uh, to think about in a broader context. Um, I guess one, one point I'd like to make, and Lionel and I haven't discuss, discussed this, but I, you know, I am aware that, and the people who've researched this extensively, historians, of, of the Queensland protection era, um, you know, it, it was the intention or it was the desire of the, the state to uh, incarcerate all Aboriginal people, you know, to have everyone in the missions. They simply couldn't afford it. You know, so there's the, the I guess the backup system was to allow some people who had uh, meaningful employment to remain on the outskirts of towns and villages in what were called country reserves. Um, and largely this was because it was just too expensive. So these um, these settlements that have been established were, you know, a great, uh, potentially a great drain, I guess, on the government. And the government did everything it could to, um, you know, to minimize that drain. And I guess one of the, one of the ways, obviously, was to keep the wages of all workers. But another was to find uh, alternatives in the area of sport and rec and leisure um, as revenue earners. And there is a there is a precedent for the sporting teams that we haven't mentioned here. Um, there were a number of communities had brass bands in the earlier period, in the early 20s, which successfully uh, gave concerts in regional areas and raised significant sums of money. So I think the government could see the potential here of, um, uh, uh, I guess, exploiting people's talents and the interest of the inmates on these reserves in performing in sport or in bands or whatever it was, but also we had to remember their desperation to get out mm. in any way they could, even mm. if it was just one day 
one afternoon for a football game. So I don't, yeah. I don't know if I, I don't know if I spoke to your, uh, to your comments. No, it, things that occurred it, to me. No, no, not at all. It's, it's really quite. I guess the, what's formulating or germinating in my mind is sort of a, a little bit of a trap that the government formed for itself as well, in the sense that, while it was okay to raise funds essentially by exploiting the people that you're caring for to generate income, they were able to make certain expenditures in that line as well. But once um, that exploitation became uh, politically or ethically, morally more difficult, they were still perhaps left with the expectations of service provision and therefore there was a net uh, increase in cost on the, um, the government stock in the, in the line of the development of the welfare state ideology as well, perhaps more after World yep. War II. Um, but really fascinating. I'm, I'm looking forward to reading the paper, actually. It's uh, very interesting. Thank you, David. Thank you. Are there any more questions now that I've monopolised things as chair? Well, in that case, we'll oh, leave it sorry, there. David. Can I ask no, a good question. Yeah. Can I ask a good question about the, the whole idea of forcing them to be in the reserves. And I'm wondering, because I often think there's sort of various turning points in history where, in relation yeah. between governments and Indigenous people and, and the community more broadly, and why they enforced them. Because they hadn't forced them, and they could have, you know, maybe voluntarily played these rugby games and gone and travelled, and it could have been a real turning point, couldn't it? Yes, absolutely. And, it, and uh, what's interesting is, um, not parallel to this, but by the 1940s, we start to see Aboriginal rugby league teams form in, uh, in, in other non-settlement communities. So uh, Bow Desert, which isn't so far from Brisbane, yeah. had an All Blacks team. Now, the, 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 this team was formed of uh, men who were either exempt from the act, uh, and again, there were such a small percentage of those people, uh, they were a negligible population, but some of those men did play football, but also of men who were on these annual or annual uh, renewable employment contracts who were under the gaze of the local protector or police, but they were able to form stable sporting teams. We had one in Brisbane called the Brisbane All Blacks that began in the 40s as well, that continued through to the 60s. Um, so, yeah, there, I mean, there are examples of these sporting teams made up of freed men. One of the dilemmas for the, um, for the administrators was having brought destitute people onto the reserves, um, they then had uh, issues of what to do with the young, healthy children who, you know, who then grew up. Right now, they, they um, so many people initially brought to places like Sherberg and Palm were uh, older or destitute or ill people, but many were single mothers or maybe not single mothers, but, but women with young children. So as children, they were dependent on the state, but as young people, they had abilities that the state could then um, capitalize on. Now, they could have released some of those young men, but very few of them were ever released and many did seek exemption. Mm -hmm. but for various reasons, um, you know, we're never allowed to, to leave. And just quickly, if I may, um, in, in WA, you see these issues as well with um, yeah, very high levels of control of, um, like I'm, I'm thinking of Sid Jackson, the Carlton player, um, mm. had his, virtually his whole life monitored uh, by the chief protector. So mm. um, I know we're running out, I think Pam had a question. Yes, I did. Um, sorry, Pam. Sorry, what was, David. Was no, there not no, at all. Sorry, Dad. Was there no public outcry about the lack of shoes? I mean, was there any sense of injustice come out in the press? Uh, Pam, that's an excellent question. I have not seen um, any expression of public outrage about that, and, there, and I have hundreds of reports of these games. Uh, no doubt there was some. I guess it's a question of you know who was mediating because these were being published, so all reports were coming through newspapers. Um, so no, I, I didn't see that. And you know the Aboriginal players themselves uh, weren't complaining about bare feet either. In fact, I think for some of those people uh, who had never worn shoes, shoes would have been a liability. So it's a you know it's a complicated issue. But as time went on, you know there's there's some clear deprivation here. Mm.
Interesting. Interesting. Folks, we'll leave it there because um, we do want to get on to the next uh, paper and we're dead on time now. So I'll, I'll use the chair's prerogative uh, to introduce Neil Barnwell, who's giving his paper, Ships That Sailed Into the Night, The Termination of Australian-Owned Container Shipping in Western Australia. Neil, it's over Thanks, to you. David. Um, how are we going here? Uh, here we go. Right, Gary, you need to shop, stop sharing. That's it. That's it. Okay. Looking good now. Okay, looking good. Um, so this is uh, a um, entitled Ships That Pass in the Night, uh, containerization on the East Coast Fremantle trade. And I'll give you a little bit of a history of that containerization of that trade. And then uh, it didn't last all that long and the reasons for its failure. Uh, I'm using a case study technique as opposed to these great uh, databases that people get with all sorts of Greek letters in their formulas and so forth. Uh, I'm not really attempting that. It's uh, a case study often used in business strategy because I used to teach business strategy and management amongst other things uh, to do a deep dive into a specific topic rather than get a, a, a large database and then try and pick out relationships with various levels of uh, confidence. Now, prior to 1964, the cargo between the East States and the West was carried by conventional vessels using traditional forms of cargo handling. This was inefficient, costs were high, and the ship owners at the time, who were not very um, well-funded anyway, uh, realized that the, the trade would be lost if they didn't find some method to reduce uh, costs. So just for those of you who might not have, uh, who might not be of an age to remember the old wharves, uh, we had um, typical war, you know, ships would be carrying things in bits and bundles and so forth, and they'd be uh, carted individually, put in the shed, then lifted again and put somewhere else. It was a terribly low, slow, very expensive process, uh, damaging for the cargo with all the multiple handlings, damaging for the waterside workers who suffered all sorts of problems and uh, musculoskeletal problems and so forth. And um, also uh, very good sometimes for people's uh, budgets because shrinkage, which is the official terms for pinching cargo, uh, was, was fairly rife. So by 1970, the service, this service had been containerized and uh, the adoption of containerization between the Eastern States and Fremantle offered great promise and new ships and terminals were built for this particular service. However, within five years, the service was terminated. Now, behind this, there is a theoretical construct and that is that uh, in the business strategy, um, when I'm discussing the difficulty, there is a, a an area, uh, there is a, um, literature on the difficulties faced by first movers sustaining their position in a particular industry. Uh, and the first movers in containerization, none of them survived to the present day. Uh, and this is just one example of that. Uh, and the other corollary is that business strategy literature promotes innovation, but it rarely, rarely addresses the fortunes of those who innovate. So, you know, it'd be hard to pick up a paper these days without you know, extolling virtues of innovation. But the reality is the history of many early, many early innovators is weak. So going back a little bit as to what led to containerization, roll off and roll, roll off, roll on, and unit load vessels, which is coagulating things into a bigger grouping, were introduced into the Bass Strait from 1959 in vessels such as these specifically built for that trade. And you can see the containers on the stern of this particular vessel, but the majority of them, they actually were roll on, roll off. We mainly drove in trucks and whatnot into the vehicle there. Um, containerization had been adopted by the Australian mainland coastal trade by 1960. Uh, they, put, they used smaller D containers. These were called D containers, so about nine cubic feet, which could carry three tonnes. And uh, they were loaded, carried on conventional vessels, as you can see here, loaded sometimes by a shore crane or alternatively by ship's derricks. 
You can, and then uh, larger containers, these are called D containers, these are called A containers, because you can see there there's an A, the C container service. Uh, and um, this was a vessel, I think it was the Barwon, that had been fitted with cranes specifically to carry these larger containers. But you can see it's an old steamship with uh, a really hardly modern vessel. And that, these would have been in the mid 60s that these vessels were flying that trade with the early stages of containerization. Now, in 1961, Makarath McEachan, which was a, um, not a big, but a prominent Melbourne ship owner, committed two million pounds to a new fully containerized container service to operate between Sydney and Melbourne, Sydney and, between Melbourne and Fremantle. Sydney wasn't in it. Um, it was chaired, Makarath McEachan was chaired by Sir Ian Potter, a really prominent Melbourne financier who was familiar with moves in America towards containerization. Now, Makarath built put an order in for, for a ship that they named Coringa, which was the first purpose-built container ship in the world. I have my doubts about that, but don't worry about it. Coringa was a very small vessel by modern standards. You can see it there, a vessel of 5,500 tonnes. And it operated what was promoted as the sea service, sea tainer service, and commenced operations in 1964. It maintained a fortnightly schedule between the two cities. At the same time, Associated Steamships was formed, ASP, uh, to combine the shipping operations of the two remaining private coastal ship owners of any note, which was McElroy, McKechn and Adelaide Steamship Company. So they combined to form this uh, Associated Steamships. This was uh, to introduce the sea tainer service. This was an excerpt from a brochure which was produced by McElroy, McKechn to promote the system. And you can see the ship has its own gantries. Uh, and loading gantries, uh, you know, trucks coming in from the wharf, um, they load up, and it was quite revolutionary in its time. Really a major technological innovation. The large containers were 16 feet, eight inches long, which was determined by the lorry loading side in Western Australia. All the containers were different sizes, determined largely by what would fit on a lorry or what was allowed on a lorry. And in Western Australia, it was 16 foot 8 inches, so that's what it's carried. And it also carried these smaller decontainers, remember the little ones, um, and spreaders, hooking them together, and on cars on cranes. And this is the vessel at sea, you can see the containers, uh, you can see the cranes on deck. And the containers were packed, or sometimes they call it the word stuff, in this Subholt Street depot in Melbourne. See, brewing that. Uh, it looks like a publicity photograph. That was the Coringa in Fremantle. You can see there were different size containers. The key, key dimension is the width and the length because that's what, the, because the slots and the guides on the ship, in actual fact, and on the spreader up above, are uh, determined uh, uh, linked to this size. Height's not such a big problem. You can see smaller ones there. If you're carrying very heavy items like metals or something, you can put it in a small container. Didn't have a top on it, but you could just slot it into the glue. And that's the Kringer and Olongo, again at Fremantle. You can see how much space there is uh, along this wharf. And uh, you can see the containers on deck there uh, with the, um, the guy in the driving the gantry there. You go back and forth with the containers. Very successful service. The only problem was sometimes you lost containers across the bike that could be stove in or ripped from their, their, ripped from their uh, securing bolts and securing security systems by heavy weather. Now, the success of the Karinga led to the building of two new vessels, each carrying 4,000 TEUs. Um, it was called the Canimbla. They were called the Canimbla Manura. And these were very modern. These are powered, efficient vessels. And, and these are the two vessels. This is the Manura in later service. Now, this permitted the introduction of a weekly East Coast Fremantle service. And this service commenced late in 1969. And one of the big uh, changes that occurred from around about 1968 was that the world had decided that containers were to be standardized at 20 feet and 40 foot long, and eight by eight wide. Um, so the 20 foot and 40 foot containers, uh, which we know today, 20 foot, we, if you look at the size of the container ship, they always say it's so many thousand TEUs. That is a uh, 20 foot, equivalent unit. Um, so 40 foot, two 
to use. And the eight foot by eight foot was uh, something that was sort of reasonable enough to fit most loading guides on the backs of lorries and lay away loading benches. Now, containerization was a new technology. Um, Associate Estinct is a great innovator, and this service offered great promise. And the service was well patronized, being mostly 80% full. But in 1975, after increasing losses, the service was withdrawn and all cargo was carried by rail. So the, next, the last or the next bit of the presentation is why did this service fail? They had to convert the Karinga as well by to 20 foot containers. So they took off the gantries and this is the Karinga after being converted. Now it's important to remember the containerization required no significant theoretical or, or inventive breakthrough. And the challenge came, challenge for management came from appreciating that the complete supply chain required to be reimagined and modernized. And there wasn't any template to follow. Cargo had been handled the same way for generation after generation. And there wasn't a template to follow in this respect. And the other thing was in modernizing and reimagining the supply chain, containerization required significant capital investment. You had to build new ships, you had to buy containers, but you also needed the supporting infrastructure, particularly terminals to handle the containers. So there was enormous upfront cost. Now to build the terminals, ASP and OCL, OCL is Overseas Container Limited, which was the big British combine, which entered the Australian container trade from Britain um, and was led by p &O. They combined to build the Sydney and Melbourne container terminals. Um, the terminal in Fremantle was built by the Port Trust and Brisbane Wars and Wool Dumping built the Brisbane terminal. Now, these were the first container terminals designed and built in the world. Uh, containers have been around for a little while, but they used existing infrastructure. These were completely new. The designers, ASP and OCL, had to try and imagine what would be the best type of terminal. There was little experience to draw upon. But they proved to be completely inadequate to the task, particularly in Sydney, but also in Melbourne. Sydney has great deep water berths, but in actual fact, the space is very, very limited. Melbourne's a little bit better off, but it's a shallower port, but um, it, to the extent that you can say the Yarra River had a delta, uh, you know, being at the mouth of the river, there's plenty of, you know, area you can dredge things out. But these terminals are far too small. And the congestion was made a lot worse by the terminals having to handle other trades, which were introduced around about 1971, 1972, all the UK, the European and the Japan trade used these terminals. Now, one container ship carried the equivalent of up to seven conventional vessels uh, carriage load. So you can see how much cargo had to pass through these terminals. The containers were stacked five high in marshalling areas, making access difficult. And the primitive computer term programs were available to assist. Now, this is the Sydney terminal. Um, it's at Balmain, you can see how close it is to the um, residential area. The rock had to be blasted away here. No one knows what they had, why they put a terminal in uh, a lot of shed. Um, but imagine all the containers having to pass through this extremely congested area. And this is another view of it as well. So you can see that it was hopeless. Um, just for comparison, that's what Botany Bay is today, Port Botany today. So you can see the enormous amounts of land which is required to marshal, store the containers. You don't need coverage for them because the container itself is its own warehouse. That's Fremantle. Uh, this is the manure. Um, this is the where it's used to birth. And again, you can see this uh, wharf, this uh, shed here, which is rather strong. Um, and that's it at the present day. Uh, I presume it's a bit busier these days. But they've completely abandoned the very small part of the wharf, the, you know, the wharf which that was used back in the early 70s. Um, so new terminal, this is another problem that the early movers had to face. New terminals came with, in, with severe industrial relations problems. Industrial relations delays became endemic Waterside workers obviously faced major redundancies. There was a steep learning curve with new equipment, strikes over demarcation disputes. No one needed tally clerks anymore. 
uh, who was going to drive the crane, who was going to unmoor the ships. You know, everyone led to strikes and fights and goodness knows what else. And this further slowed container handling rate. So it had congestion in the terminals, uh, industrial relations issues with the, with the uh, uh, labour at the terminal. And also Sydney terminals in Sydney were hampered by community concerns about noise. And all of these complications and congestions led to significant delays which disrupted schedules and increased costs. The first mover didn't have an advantage. There are also the modal difficulties, particularly a shortage of trucks, which could carry the 20 foot and 40 foot containers. The 40 foot container was somewhat new, um, and there was very, very few trucks which could handle it. There were issues with getting permission from various road authorities to carry a 40 foot truck in certain areas and so forth. So 40 foot containers could be stuck on the wharf just waiting for a truck to um, carry them. And one of the downsides of containerization is that uh, the containers needed to be loaded and unloaded on a return voyage. So even if there, there was never a return cargo from Fremantle, um, most of the trade was from east to west, but the containers needed to be loaded and unloaded through the same torturous process for a, on a return voyage, which slowed matters down. It's an issue now, I don't know whether you follow containerization, but you know, the, the, a lot of congestion in Australian ports and there others around the world being absolutely chopped off with empty containers waiting to be returned to China or in Europe. There was also sharp competition from a rejuvenated railway connection. Standard gauge between uh, Sydney and Perth was uh, inaugurated in 1970. Uh, it was run by a number of different rail systems, none of them made profit and none of them were particularly concerned with profit as long as they ran and um, uh, kept body and soul together, they weren't really a profit making enterprise. So, but there was sharp competition. There was also unfortunately unsettled political and economic conditions uh, at the time. I don't know whether you remember the early 70s, um, maybe, probably not, sorry to insult you all. Uh, particularly significant inflationary pressures. Inflation uh, reached 25% a year during the, um, you know, 72, 73, 74. Uh, there was limited means, one of the things the government did was introduce what was called the Prices Justification Tribunal as an artificial means to keep the prices down. So if you wanted to increase your prices, you had to go and argue in front of the Prices Justification Tribunal, which was um, really couldn't raise your price all that much. Now politically, the times were, it was also difficult to actually maintain decent uh, accounting systems when, you're, when your inflation rate is 25%. Politically, the times were difficult, which led to further industrial unrest. They were got with them to this economy. Now, ownership of ASP also changed. In 1972, TNT, which you may remember, became a 50% owner. TNT was um, managed by Sir Peter Abellis, who some of you might remember, became a 50% owner of ASP. But TNT's time horizon was short and it had an outside influence upon the business. In other words, it wasn't thinking long term. It was just really, if there wasn't any money, we were going to get out of this and we wait for it to improve. And compounding that was that these two new ships, the uh, Kamimura and Manura, were modern and they were up to date and could find profitable activities elsewhere. They were chartered overseas initially. They operated transatlantic runs um, they had very long lives up into the 1990s. Uh, the ship, nothing wrong with the ships, they were superb vessels. Uh, and the, the fact that they could be popular to be used elsewhere uh, was a negative for keeping them on the Australian coast. Now we should also note, however, that exiting the, the trade was part of a long-term decline of general cargo shipping on the Australian coast. Uh, and ASP probably, apart from being having the first container ship in the world built from the keel up was probably the first container operator in the world to exit the container trade in 1975. Now being the first mover did not provide ASP with any advantage. And let's just have briefly look at the industry development since that time and hopefully, which might help us for real life. There's a better understanding of the ship terminal interface. Terminals are now far more efficient. They're far bigger. There's a lot more money goes into them. 
their favourite investments, infrastructure investments for things like wealth management funds and sovereign funds and superannuation funds and so forth, they're looking for steady long-term returns to match their long-term commitments to uh, superannuation holders and so forth. So you're not building stuff, not so much on the cheap, but you know, with constrained products and company and uh, local authorities, state governments, go, any government goes out of its way to try and build the most modern terminal as they can to try and attract as much trade as they can through their port. Skills in IT are now available, uh, which weren't available when the trade was entered. Uh, I mentioned earlier for capital for privately owned terminals and support services and also containers may be leased. You don't have to return them. If you just want to ship from um, Sydney to Singapore, you just load Sydney to Singapore and dump a container to a terminal. You hire a container terminal like you hire a car. Um, the biggest container op uh, owner in the world, um, I think there's about 6 million containers that it leases out to various company ships, ship owners and operators don't need to really own their own containers anymore. Financiers better understand the system. And also the number of uh, global operators is actually quite small as the uh, trade has um, led to enormous uh, benefits if you form a big network. Uh, the bigger the network, uh, the more people are going to start to share, share uh, ship containers through the system. ASP of course didn't really have a network. So no early movers in containerization survived in the long term and this mirrors industries such as computers and cars. If you get on that marvelous source Wikipedia and look at old computer companies, um, you'll find it's as long as your arm. Uh, you know, they sort of bloom for a little while and then they go out of date. Great idea, you know, Google wasn't the first mover in search and uh, nor was Facebook an early mover in um, whatever Facebook does. Um, but uh, so the early movers really, but we, all of us could name computer companies that, you know, from our youth that no longer exist. So the early movers essentially don't really get, um, generally don't have long lives. You know, that those who can see what's happening, better financed, come in later and start to dominate the trade. They take over the smaller operators. Um, now, the trade still continues actually on overseas vessels. Um, they, as part of an overseas voyage, there's about 7,000 TEUs a month run from uh, the Eastern States to Fremantle uh, on overseas, owned vessel, uh, overseas trade vessels. Um, they pick them up as part of an overseas voyage and uh, just as an example, there's a, one trade that does carry them that goes uh, Sydney, Melbourne, Fremantle, um, Singapore, Colombo and a few other, the Middle East and into Europe and at each port they're picking and dropping containers off. Uh, it's just like a bus service where you get on, you know, get on and get off where you want to with the uh, container, this, these particular vessels just pick up containers. Just like a bus service and drop them off between ports. So the trade is quite robust at 7,000 a month. Now I've got here um, Bill Gates, the question mark is not saying this is Bill Gates, but he was supposed to have said that uh, people overestimate the short-term impact of new technology but underestimate its long-term impact. Those early movers of in, in computerization where they just thought of computerized, um, containerized, containerizing one trade uh, would be amazed at the way that the globalize, the, the computer system, computer uh, globalization has um, developed very long term. Look, it's really reshaped. It's one of the most desirable parts of ports now are, of course, uh, gentrified wharves that people sit down and drink out and all this sort of stuff. Uh, not so much in Fremantle, David, but certainly Melbourne and Sydney, Darling Harbour and so on. Um, for those who lived through this period, such as I did, it's a lot of, uh, most of them are really just shocked at how between 1970 and 1980, uh, how things in an industry which hadn't changed for long periods of time so radically changed. Uh, and um, the demand for people dropped, whole fleets of ships were taken to the scrap heap. New ones took their place, new terminals in remote parts of ports were built and so on. 
So anyway, that's, uh, gee, I've done that very quickly. I've spoken too fast, but thanks for listening. Um, and obviously we have uh, a very small number of people, so probably not any questions. So get an early afternoon too. Has anyone got any questions? Thank you, Neil. Questions, anybody? No. So, uh, oh, go on, on. Someone, yeah, go on, Andrew. I was just going to comment, actually, I worked on the container stevedoring monitoring report for many years at the ACCC, so I do have good knowledge of this industry. And one thing that's fascinating too, Neil, is the intermodal hubs which have now been developed. Mm. So you're saying about the whole supply chain, the ships, the containers come off the ships onto trucks or trains to an intermodal hub, like there's one next to uh, Perth Airport, there's also one at Moorbank in Sydney, and then they're put onto another truck to be sent somewhere else, but it's just that same container transporting the goods all over the place. Yes, no, it is. Uh, you know, the, the invest, but all of that requires enormous amounts of investment. And I think one of the things with, yeah. uh, with uh, ASP was in its early days, you know, it failed to grasp really the amount of investment that was required. And it wasn't looked, I mean, it was owned by yeah. shipping companies that really weren't well financed and, you know, had a lot of problems with depressions and wars and goodness knows what else. So, um, the, the fail to grasp the amount of space that was required to do these things uh, and the amount of infrastructure. Um, and when you're talking about uh, the, the terminals, um, inland terminals, for instance, you mm -hmm. know, state governments coming up and building the railway, for instance, and, you know, the rail infrastructure. Um, so, uh, I, you know, the, uh, so really, if you are an early mover, it's yeah. very difficult to to actually overcome most of these enormous difficulties. A financial Interesting. Issue. Malcolm Tull, you had a um, question. Yes, thanks, uh, Neil, very interesting uh, paper. I think it's obviously a complex multifaceted issue why it failed, but I'm just wondering whether, I mean, I think quite rightly you've just mentioned about the need for a huge capital investment in order to reap the scale economies, and that was beyond probably those initial companies. But to my mind, the overriding issue of the time facing ship owners in particular was low productivity, disappointing productivity gains. And this was partly due to the serious industrial relations problems on the Australian waterfront, not simply the strike rate, but also the prevalence of uh, restrictive practices. And these meant that the operating costs on shore and uh, were high by international standards. But also, of course, then ship owners continuously complained about the wage costs uh, and manning ratios on their ships on the Australian coastline as well. So it's almost like a cocktail of issues which um, the company would have faced as a pioneer. And uh, it's um, not altogether surprising in the sense that it was uh, eventually forced to withdraw. Just no, that's you... right, Malcolm, 100%. Oh, look, I didn't like to stress too much those. Uh, I, I did mention the learning curve, I think, with learning to use the new equipment. And uh, the, yeah, the strikes are terrible. But look, if you were, I think, if you possibly look at the minds of the ship owners at the time, moving away from the traditional methods of cargo handling probably blinded you to the fact that this was going to take an awful long time to bed in. And once a culture of confrontation starts to build, such as on the waterfront as it had done during the 20th century, early part of the 20th century, you know, it carries over, it carried over to the terminals. It's still going on, you know, there's still protected um, industrial issues in Melbourne, which are going on as we speak. Um, uh, yeah, no, look, 100% correct. Um, and I, you know, this trade to Perth, uh, Fremantle, could probably be a lot more uh, vibrant than it is in foreign vessels, even it's carried in foreign vessels, uh, if there was a bit more reliability on the waterfront at the present time. I don't know whether you agree or not. But, uh, sure. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for your comments, Malcolm. And um, uh, I appreciate it. I know you're well versed in this area, so I appreciate it. Any other questions or comments to Neil? Well, the only other one I have before we sign off, Neil, is I sort of envisage you're touching on ports now having cafes and things like that in them. I'd be very interested in a paper 
that explores the cost of fishing chips at um, four ports around the country because in Fremantle we're paying 28 or 29 dollars a serve and I'm not quite sure that's uh, that's quite uh, appropriate so um, but we can we can set that aside we can deal with that as a as another paper perhaps down well maybe track. everyone's used to exploiting the waterfront from the work <laughs> to the um to the uh, you know the ship the shop owners and must uh, be it must be back out of the, the water view it must be. I, I must admit, the last time I bought fish and chips for the family, I thought I'd bought, it, bought a share in the shop, but um, it's all good. Um, thank you very much, folks. I think if there's no more comments or questions, we will finish up a little early. Um, our next session is the penultimate session um, and last papers, uh, session 7A and B. So there's two options, and we're coming back together again at uh, 3.30 Australian Eastern Summer Time. So thanks again, uh, chaps, for your presentations, and we'll look forward to seeing you shortly. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. See ya. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Bye.